Okay, praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy faithfulness for this day which Thou hast made, that we rejoice and be glad in it. We thank Thee for giving us this day our daily bread, and as man shall the labor bread alone, but every word is proceeded out of Thy mouth. We thank Thee, O Lord, for preserving Thy pure words for us. Thy word, O Lord, it endureth forever. The word by Thy gospel is preached unto us. Thy word, which Thou hast magnified above all of Thy name, sanctify us with Thy truth, for Thy word is truth, as we pray to be sanctified and cleansed to the washing of the water of Thy word, to be presented unto Thee, O Lord, a glorious church, that having spot nor wrinkle any such thing, to be holy and without blemish. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Before we hear for the preaching of God's word, once again, I'd like to give another testimony. Let's turn to Bible's book of 2 Corinthians. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 2, it is written, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, it is written, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. We are epistles, living epistles for Christ. We are known and read of all men, as is written, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Being that we live in a country in which only 0.05% of the population professes any form of Christianity, therefore over 99% of the population here in this country are not Christians, do not profess any form of Christianity, we are the Bible that they read. We're the only Bible that many here in this land ever get to read. They're reading our lives. As Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 5, in the book of Matthew chapter 5, Beginning in verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Ye are the light of the world. If you're a Christian, if you're born again, you cannot help this fact, this gospel truth, that ye are the light of the world. A city that set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, but under a bushel, but on a candlestick and give the light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Because we that are born again, we that are Christians, are lights in this world. We must shine in such a way. What kind of way? In a way that men would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Because they are reading our lives. We are epistles known and read of all men. They, are, they know us. And they're reading our lives, no matter where we go, no matter what we do. Therefore, it is written of the apostles in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, as an example for us to follow, as it is written in God's word, in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, it is written, And they, the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ, went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord worked with them and confirming the word with signs following, Amen. They didn't just preach in the church and they didn't just preach in certain areas. They preached everywhere. Wherever they went, they preached the gospel as it is written in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. It is written in verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead as appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be in season, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. When are we to preach? In season, out of season, all of the time. Why are we to preach? The apostles left this example. They preached everywhere. 
Why is that? Because we're lights in this world, as Christ says, you're the light of the world, therefore you're the light so shine before men that they may see your works and glorify our Father which is heaven, because we are epistles, known and read of all men. They're reading our lives. They're watching us all of the time. Therefore we must preach everywhere and all of the time, instant, in season, and out of season, praise the Lord. How many professing Christians I have witnessed who want to do the work of an evangelist, but they're hypocrites when they do so. What is a hypocrite? Hypocrite is the Greek word we have borrowed in the English tongue, which means actor. An actor, they act like preachers at certain times. Maybe on Sunday morning from behind the pulpit. Maybe on certain street corners or certain markets at certain times. They'll act like a preacher. And then when they finish preaching, then they act like a normal person. And only when it comes to preaching time, will they then lift up the voice of like a trumpet and preach the gospel. And when they finish preaching, it's like they clock in and clock out. Okay, I'm finished preaching now. And they act like somebody completely different than what they were on that street corner. Once again, I've testified. One of the biggest compliments, the best compliments I've ever received, was before the invention of social media. When people used to write on blogs, they used to write about me here in Bangkok, Thailand. And on one blog they wrote about me, they called me a Mormon missionary. Of course, I'm not a Mormon. I do not believe in the doctrines, the false doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is founded by a false prophet, Joseph Smith. But they were calling me a Mormon at that time on a blog written about me preaching the gospel in the red light areas here in Bangkok, Thailand. Finally, one of them wrote said, no, that brother Tony is not a Mormon. He wrote, he's a Pentecostal. And then he defined what he thought a Pentecostal was. He said he worked with a so-called Pentecostal. And he says, though Pentecostals, they live it day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then the blog went that they couldn't believe it. That that brother Tony, what he does on those street corners, on the videos they've seen of me preaching the gospel, he does all the time. And this person is going to affirm, yes, that's the way what he called Pentecostals are. They live it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the people in the blog could not even believe that. Praise God. But yes, that's the way we are as Christians. We don't just preach the gospel at certain times and certain days a week. We're preaching the gospel all the time, everywhere. Wherever we go, we're preaching the gospel. As the Apostle Paul left us an example in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Beginning in verse 14 that is written, the Apostle Paul writes in the inspiration of the Ghost, I am debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. And don't we feel the same way? Aren't we indebted unto all men? When I was born again back in 1995, I knew I was indebted to all men to preach the gospel to every creature. When I saw the goodness of God contained in the gospel of Christ back in 1995, which led to my salvation, which led to me being born again, I knew I had to go out and preach to everyone else. And even to this very day, 22 years later, I continue to have this debt. I am indebted to all men to preach the gospel of them. As is written, I am debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and wise. So much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. Being that we're indebted unto men, we are ready to preach Everywhere we go and to everyone we meet, we are ready. No matter what it is that I do, no matter where it is that I go, I always make sure to spend time in the prayer closet first. Why? To make sure that I'm ready. To make sure that I'm endued with power from on high. Even if I'm just going down the road to get a haircut, I'm going to make sure I spend time in the prayer closet first. Because even just going down the road to get a haircut, there are souls I'm going to meet, souls I need to preach the gospel to, souls that are watching my life, that are reading me an epistle, none of all men, read of all men. Therefore, I must always be ready, 
in sin, in season, out of season, to preach the word of God to everyone, everywhere, as we're lights in this world, that our lights so shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And praise God yesterday, as my wife went down to a local market yesterday morning to buy some fruit, as we eat a lot of fruit, being that we live in the tropics, you've got to eat a lot of fruit to survive here. Your body sweats a lot here, and you're sweating out vitamins and minerals that are much needed here in the tropics, which there's a lot of bacteria. And only if your immune system is strong can your body fight all the bacteria here in this tropical country, especially during this season, which is known as the wet season or the rainy season, in which there's a lot of bacteria out there, and you've got to eat a lot of good foods, especially a lot of fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. As my wife went to the market yesterday morning to buy some fresh fruits and fresh vegetables, praise God, as is written, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. And we praise God the Lord blesses us with the good of the land to eat. A woman called my wife over to her vendor. She went to talk to my wife. She confessed she has been watching my wife for the past three years. Every time my wife went to the market for three years now, this woman has been watching her, she says. Every time my wife fed a homeless person, every time my wife helped a person there at the market, every gospel track my wife gave out, every time my wife smiled, every time my wife would say, God bless you to people, every time my wife would preach the gospel and be a witness to others, this woman, this vendor, she confessed. She has been watching my wife. For the past three years. And one to talk to her because this woman used to be a Christian how many years ago? Fifteen years ago. Fifteen years ago, she was a Christian for seven years, right? For seven years she went to church. Seven years she professed to be a Christian. Fifteen years ago she was faithfully going to church. Faithfully serving the Lord for seven years. And then 15 years ago she completely fell away. Because she fell in love with a man that was not a Christian. And the church that she went to told her she had to choose between the church or that man. And she chose that man who led her away from church, which led her away from Christianity, which led her away from the Lord. And now that man is nowhere around in her life anymore. And there for three years, she's witnessed my wife, a Christian, watched her. And told my wife that every time she saw her, it reminded her of those seven years in which she was a Christian. And now after three years of witnessing my wife, watching my wife, reading her life, yesterday, praise God, she called my wife over with a heart's desire of wanting to return back to the Lord, wanting to return back to the faith, wanting to get back right with the Lord. Praise the Lord. How long did it take? Three years. Three years of what? Of being faithful, faithful to the Lord, of living out our Christianity. We don't just believe with Jesus Christ with our lips. We believe Jesus Christ with our lives. And what we believe, we live day by day as we are epistles known and read of all men. Are you a Christian? Do you profess to be a Christian? What do others see in your lives? What are they reading about you? Are they reading what a Christian should be? If they were to read the Bible and then read your life, is it the same story? Is it the same thing? Or is it different? If a person can read your life and read the Bible and see two different things, the Bible has a word for you. It's called hypocrite. You're just an actor. You're just a put on. But if people can read the Bible and they read your life and see it's the same thing as what they're reading the Bible, you are a light in this world. You're an epistle known and read of all men, a witness unto Jesus Christ, leading sinners and backsliders back to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's return to the book of Acts, chapter 2, continuing God's word. As we look at this first apostolic sermon preached in the book of Acts, 
preached by the Apostle Peter. In verse 22, the Apostle Peter preaches, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonder signs, which God did by you, God, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Colon, verse 23. The Apostle Peter preaches once again to these Jews gathered in Jerusalem from all over the world on the day of Pentecost and proselytes as well, those who converted to the Judaism, those who converted to the Jewish religion, as he's preaching them from all over the world, gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, he preaches to them that Jesus, now the man approved of God among them, by miracles, wonders, signs, which God did by him in the midst of them, as they themselves also knew. Colon. Now he explains, verse 23, Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. They knew this Jesus of Nazareth was a man approved of God. For three and a half years, Christ did his earthly ministry. And during those three and a half years, Jews from around the world and proselytes, those converted to Judaism, would have to go to Jerusalem three times in a year. For three different feasts of three times in the year, they had to appear at Jerusalem. And when they appeared at Jerusalem on those three times in the year, they heard of Jesus they saw Jesus. And those who did not go or those who were not able to be an eyewitness of Jesus, they would hear from others about Jesus. For three and a half years, he was the big news of Jerusalem. They would go to those feasts on those certain times of the year in Jerusalem looking for Jesus, seeing if he would be there with their eyes open wanting to see Jesus after they've heard so much about him. Because he was a man approved of God among them by miracles, wonders, and signs, and which God did by him in the midst of them. And they knew this. God was doing these miracles, wonders, and signs by Christ Jesus in the midst of them because he was a man approved of God. But something happened. Something happened that those Jews considered foolishness. First Corinthians. Can you figure an excerpt of two? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. It is written of the Jews, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified. Even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when the apostles preached Christ, they preached his crucifixion. They preached the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But again, they preached his death, his crucifixion. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews. What is it? A stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But in them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ of our God and the wisdom of God. When the apostles in the New Testament preached the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, which much emphasis on his death to the Jews they preached to, it was a stumbling block. It was what hindered them from believing in Jesus. And unto the Greeks they preached to, it was foolishness to them. So foolish that they didn't even want to hear it. But unto them that were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. If they at that time did not preach the death of Jesus, did not preach the crucifixion of Jesus, the Jews then may have listened more. The Jews then may have been one to their religion, but they preached the crucifixion of Jesus, which became a stumbling block to the Jews, and was foolishness unto the Greeks. 
so that only those that were called, only those whom God had called, would be saved, would be born again, would be engrafted, inherited into the kingdom of God. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews. Acts chapter 2. Here in Thailand, the majority of the population profess to be Buddhists. In reality, the majority of the population are Theravada Buddhists slash Brahmin Hindus slash animists. The foundation of the Thai religion is animism. That is the worship of spirits. And they've also received Theravada Buddhism as well as Brahmin Hinduism. And they've mixed these three religions together. Yet it's known as Buddhism around the world. And most Thai people would profess that they are Buddhists if you ask them what their religion was. If you'd ask them, are you a Hindu too? They would mostly say no as they don't have much idea about how they have mixed Hinduism, Brahmin Hinduism, and Buddhism, and animism together into one religion. But they would profess to be Buddhists. They profess that they follow Buddha. And when we preach the crucifixion of Jesus Christ to those who profess to be Buddhists, how do they react to it? In Buddhism, through a Buddhist mindset, through the Buddhist eyes, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ to them is foolishness. Why is it foolishness to them? Because whom they follow in Buddhism, in which they call Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, he taught in his teachings that love leads to suffering. And that suffering is bad. And his promise and of his followers were, if they follow his teachings, they could get out of suffering, the cycle of suffering and life. And attain to a thing called nirvana, which they believe is the end of all suffering. Hence, they believe life is suffering, the world's full of suffering, and this man, so Dr. Gautama, believed they follow his teachings, you can be saved from suffering. And he taught that love leads to suffering. And when we preach that God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we are sinners, Christ died for us. They consider it foolishness. They think, see, look at that. If he had only followed Buddha, he would not have had to suffer on that cross. He missed it. And they think Christianity is a foolish religion. Missionaries have come here for many centuries here to Thailand. Well, not many centuries, but they've come here for at least over two cent or century, a century and a half, close to two centuries. They've come to Thailand preaching the gospel. Missionaries, especially in the past, had to suffer here. Had to make sacrifices to preach the gospel here. Before the term missionary meant somebody who would dedicate their life so much to the Lord that they were going to suffer for the Lord. That's why there are so few missionaries throughout church history as was a life of suffering. And you read the, the histories of those early missionaries, you read how much they suffered in the lands they went to. Many of them suffered martyrdom. Many of them suffered disease, lost their families, and lost their lives on the mission field. And then the Buddhists, they looked at Christians as foolish. Why would you do such a thing like that? Why would you suffer so much for? Even to this very day, many even professing Christians with a Buddhist mindset look down upon me here in Thailand. They have nothing to do with me because they think, why does he have to suffer like that for? Why is that they're preaching the gospel? I've heard sometimes Brother Tony has to walk to preach the gospel. Years ago, a church I used to preach at, they used to invite me every month to preach in the pulpit on the Lord's Day. And then on that certain year, they already scheduled me in for a whole year ahead of time on the third Sunday of every month to preach in their pulpit. And there was in January time frame, we had already scheduled in for the whole year. They asked us this. They requested this of us to reserve the third Sunday for them every month at their church. We said yay to that. We scheduled that in because before we used to be scheduled two years ahead of time in different churches all over Thailand as I preached God's word that Lord's day, I gave them a testimony. And my testimony was, had to walk to preach the gospel that previous Friday night, and because it was a hot day that Friday, it was a very hot and humid night, I came down with a heat stroke, 
As I arrived at Pat Pong Road, Royston preached the gospel. And after that two and a half hour, three hour walk, I came down with a heat stroke. I testified how I didn't have enough money to take for buses. And I had a little money for a bus to go back, which I was going to save to get a bus back. But I was hot and sweating so much, so having a heat stroke, that I spent that little bit of change to buy a bottle of water. And I went into McDonald's, which is air-conditioned, not because of the McDonald's food. We avoid that fast food, that junk food. But I went there to drink that bottle of water in the air-conditioning. And there was air-conditioning, and I was drinking a cold bottle of water. I could not cool down. I was having a heat stroke. And now it was impossible for me to preach that gospel that night. And how in the world I'm going to walk back to where we currently live two and a half hours, three hours away. As I sat there, sipping on that cold bottle of water, having this heat stroke, a quote-unquote man walked right into that McDonald's, went straight up towards me, put his hand on my shoulders and said, you're doing a good job here. You're making an impact. I want you to know that. And then walked out the side door, walked in the McDonald's to touch me on my shoulder to say that, and walked right out the side door. And after he touched me, my whole body recovered, and I was miraculously healed. Now I was able to preach the gospel that night. I was able to walk back to where I currently live without any problems whatsoever. Praise God. What a miracle. I testified about this at that church on that Lord's Day, in which they asked me to preach for a whole year on the third Sunday of every month. And when I gave that testimony, nobody praised God. Nobody rejoiced in the Lord. They all seemed to look at me strange. After the church service, the lunch here in the churches, went downstairs to eat lunch. They put us at a table by ourselves and overheard the pastor and his wife talking out loud. They did not realize how loud they were talking. And the pastor asked his wife in the Thai tongue, what did he say happened to him again? And she replied back, he said he was having a heat stroke. And he said to her, they have like that too? She said, yeah, like that. And after that, that pastor told me that they would call us again if they ever only preach to the church, and they've never called us again many years later. Why is that? They have a Buddhist mindset. To them, suffering is wrong. To them, sacrifice is wrong. To them, serving the Lord in which it caused you to suffer, to them is a wrong thing, is a foolish thing, as they still have a Buddhist mindset. And to them, love leads to suffering, and suffering is wrong. We believe as a Christian, we are to suffer as Christ suffered. How? Why do we believe this for? First Peter In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called. Called unto what? To suffer wrongfully. As is written in verse 19, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience or God into grief, suffering wrongfully. Therefore, in testimony time, if anybody wants to praise the Lord and thank God for anything, this is what is thankworthy if you suffer wrongfully. Verse 20, For what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults, ye you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin. If you're following the steps of Jesus Christ, you will do no sin. If you sin, you are not following the steps of Jesus Christ. You are not a follower of Jesus Christ. In short, you are not worthy to be called a Christian. And if you profess to be a Christian, you sin. Not only are you not following Jesus Christ, you are a fake. You are a hypocrite. You are an actor. No, the Bible commands us, ye should follow 
Christ steps. Verse 22, who did no sin. That's the steps we are to follow. To do no sin. Once again, thou shalt call this name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in his name? For neither is there salvation than any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby you must be saved. Do you believe in the name, the name of Jesus? Are you his people? Are you a Christian? Are you part of the people of Jesus? Then he has saved you from your sin and not in your sin. Therefore, to follow in Christ's steps, you are to do no sin. Who did no sin, neither was guile, found in his mouth. We that believe in the New Testament, we are against lying. Jesus Christ says our yea must be yea, our nay must be nay, anything out of this is evil. And then in the book of Revelation, and given a list of who goes to hell, it says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 21 Verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn the fires in brimstone, which is the second death. All liars. If you lie for a good cause, you will still end up in the lake of fire. All liars. Why must we say that? Because we know of churches in which an elder, who is now the pastor of the church, who I rebuke for lying, came up with this whole thing that's okay to lie if you have a reason for it, and gave excuses of why you can lie at certain different times, and saying that lying is okay. But the Bible says, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth the fire brimstone. Therefore, to follow Christ's steps, who did no sin, we are not to sin as well. To follow Christ's steps, neither is guile found in his mouth. We shall have no guile in our mouths as well. No lying. For all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Liars go to hell. Jesus Christ says, doctrine commends us, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. These are the steps we're to follow. How many revile us and rail against us? There are professing Christians that wonder why I don't fellowship with them for. They ask me, why don't I reply back to their messages? Why don't I fellowship with them? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it is written, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, it is written, But now I've written to you not to keep company. If any man that's called a brother be a fornicate or covetous or an idolater or a railer, or a drunkard or extortioner, was such a one, no, not to eat. We have no fellowship with professing Christians who call themselves brethren, yet they rail, they revile. We have no fellowship with such a one. And today on the internet is given both to thing they call internet trolls. Trolling in the Bible is called railing. And how many people will follow these sermons and all they do is want to write messages and comments about all these different things that they don't agree with, that they don't believe in, they don't preach the gospel, they don't serve the Lord. In fact, some of them have professed even smoking drugs and think it's okay to do so, which the Bible calls witchcraft or sorcery, which will damn your soul to hell. Marijuana smokers, if they do not repent, will end up in hell when they die. The Bible says, be not deceived. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And all they do is smoke their marijuana and then rail on us who are serving the Lord when they themselves don't serve the Lord, when they themselves don't preach the gospel. The Bible calls them railers. And if a person professes to be a Christian, a brethren, and then is a railer, the Bible commands us to have no fellowship with them. We have nothing to do with such a one as that. For Christ gave us example for us to follow, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. We're to resist not evil, 
were to bless those that curse us. When he suffered, he threatened not, but commit himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins is open in the tree, that we being dead the sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. Not only did Christ do this for our salvation, he did this as an example that we should follow in verse 21. For even here in two were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leave us an example that you should follow his steps. Acts chapter 2. The apostle Peter is preaching the Jews from around the world on the day of Pentecost and proselytes the Jewish religion. He is preaching them of Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among them by miracle signs and wonders God did behave in the midst of them as they knew already and they knew this already. But there was a stumbling block. What was that stumbling block to stop them from believing in Jesus? Though he was approved of God by miracles of wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of them as they knew they knew it was from God, they knew he was from God. What was the stumbling block? What hindered them from repenting and being born again. Verse 23, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. His crucifixion was a stumbling block. He was crucified. They witnessed his crucifixion. As he hung there on the cross, they reviled him. If thou be the Christ, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, save thyself and will believe. He didn't save himself. On that cross, he could have called down the legion of angels to deliver him, but he chose not to do so. On that cross, he could have stopped them all, but he chose not to do so. He chose to willingly suffer on the cross for us. It became a stumbling block to the Jews. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was a stumbling block to these Jews and now the apostle Peter preached to them of Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know, preaches him being delivered by the eternal counsel and for knowledge of God. It was prophesied that Christ should suffer. It was written in God's holy written word that Christ would suffer for our sins. It was already determined by God. It was already prophesied by the Lord since the beginning there in the Garden of Eden when Adam first sinned. The Lord told Satan that of the seed of the woman to crush his head. He would bruise his heel, but the seed of the woman to crush his head. There it was. Christ would crush Satan's head, yet his heel would be bruised. He would suffer in doing so. From the beginning, all throughout the Old Testament, the crucifixion of Christ was prophesied. And the apostle Peter preaches to these Jews of the crucifixion of Christ, the gospel of Christ, as is written in God's word in the Old Testament as it was a summing block to these Jews to believe in Jesus as the crucifixion was a summing block to them. And so it is today, even in this country, in which the majority of the population profess to be Buddhists. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is a summing block to them. And more so, us following Jesus Christ is a summing block to them. A suffering for Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to them. So much so that here in Thailand, amongst the professing Christians, the majority of them, if not all of them, refuse to suffer for the Lord. In every church in Thailand, they know the Great Commission to go into the world and preach the gospel of every creature. In every church in Thailand, missionaries from around the world have told them you've got to go out there and preach the gospel because over 99% of the population are not saved. 99% of the population are not yet professed to be Christian. But they refuse to do so. No matter how many missionaries tell them to do it. No matter how many books are written to do it. No matter how many sermons they hear. No matter how many scriptures they read. The reason why they refuse to do so they don't want to suffer for the Lord. They're scared of suffering. 
They refuse to suffer. Suffering to them is foolishness. Their idea of Christianity is what would they get out of it? What will God give them if they become a Christian? What good things will they get out of it? But they refuse to suffer for the Lord. They refuse to follow His steps. Just not sinning in Thailand will cause persecution. If you don't drink with the many alcoholics here, they'll get mad at you. If you don't smoke drugs with the many drug addicts here, they'll get mad at you. If you don't fornicate with the many fornicators here, they'll get mad at you. If you don't commit adultery with the many adulterers here, they'll get mad at you. And if you preach out against these sins, even amongst the professing Christians here in Thailand, in adultery, and you preach out against the sin of adultery, they get mad at you. They want to persecute you. They want to do anything they can to stop you, anything they can to hinder you from serving the Lord. Why is that? Because to serve the Lord to follow his steps, you must suffer as Christ suffered. And this is a stumbling block to the Jews. It is a stumbling block to the many Buddhists and those with a Buddhist mindset. How do we enter in to the kingdom of God? It's by the way of suffering. Acts chapter, I believe it is. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. It is written, of the apostles confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorted them to continue the faith and that we must, not maybe, that we must through much, not a little bit, much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. If you are not going through much tribulation, you are not entering into the kingdom of God. You are on the wrong path. You're on the wrong way. If you're not going through much tribulation, you're not in the way of the kingdom of God. For the apostle says, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. As it was foretold and prophesied in the Old Testament, that Christ would suffer on the cross, that Christ would suffer for our sins. It is foretold and prophesied in the New Testament that his followers would suffer as well. As was foretold of Christ by the German Council of God that Christ would suffer on the cross, so it's foretold and prophesied of those who follow Christ in the New Testament that we would suffer as well. And if we're entering to the kingdom of God, we must go through much tribulation, for this is the way into the kingdom of God. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word which endureth forever. Thank thee for preserving thy pure words for us. Pray this even sanctifies with thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.